All right, uh, now the aforementioned uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. He has surged to the point of being the it candidate. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse because, Vivek, it's going to mean you could be a target in next week's debate. We yeah. already learned that the, the DeSantis forces plan to make you one. Now, they disavow this so-called campaign secret that came out. But what do you make of that? Look, I think that we're doing well, Neil, because I am speaking the truth in an unapologetic way. That has been the strategy of this campaign since day one. I began at 0.0% in the polls in March. I'm now in second place in many of the polls coming out over the weekend. And I think we're going to continue with that same strategy where a lot of the Republican Party for a long time has been focused on what are we running from? I'm asking the question of what are we running to? to our vision of what it actually means to be an American, leading with specificity on what will actually get done while in office. I think people are hungry for that kind of vision in our party. I think it does take an outsider to deliver. I'm also the youngest person ever to run in our party. I think that helps me bring a fresh perspective that others have not. And that's exactly what I'm going to be doing on that debate stage. You have brilliantly kind of threaded the needle, you know, with with, uh, you know, supporting Donald Trump and, and, and said that he was a very good president. I believe the best of this last century. Uh, but but on, when it comes to January 6th and his personal actions, you didn't flip over then. But bottom line, you haven't ticked him off. His supporters still think a great deal of you. But that could change. And your rise in the polls could change the former president's view of you. Are you worried about that? See, the way I look at it, Neil, is I'm not running against anybody in this race. It's part of why you don't hear me criticize many of my competitors, period, Donald Trump included. I think we have to, as a party, start talking less about the who, more about the what and the why. What do we stand for and why do we stand for it? Even with respect to criticizing Biden or the left, I depart from the Republican Party on this. I don't think that's the winning strategy. I am bored of talking about Joe Biden. I think the American people are, too. That's why the 2022 so-called red wave never came. It's not going to be good enough to criticize even Biden. We have to offer an agenda and an affirmative vision of our own. The way I explain it to the people is that Biden isn't really even the president in charge. It's the managerial class and the administrative state, the deep state. And we have to explain to the American people how that impedes the economy, how that reduces accountability of government, how that actually drains the lifeblood out of a three branch constitutional republic. If we do that, we win this election in a landslide. If we resort back to talking points from the Republican Party to sound like a bunch of partisan hacks, I think we're going to have the same disappointing result in 2024 that we did in 2022. That does take an outsider to deliver. And that's why I'm in this race. Well, you are getting a lot more scrutiny now and a lot more press and attention, but it also invites a lot more scrutiny of your business past. Uh, Bloomberg is reporting about these uh, two former employees who filed lawsuits uh, against your firm that when you were running it with your co-founder, Anson, or, or I'm sorry, Anson Fricks, Ferex, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Anyway, they say that uh, bottom line, the business practices didn't match up with sort of the rhetoric. They also suggest the company struggle to meet some lofty goals for an anti-ESG strategy. Uh, that, 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 this is all new to a lot of people, but I did want to give you a chance to respond to that. Oh, it's totally laughable, Neil. And it's funny how you see the attacks leading up as my rise in the polls continues. The fact of the matter is I found it Strive. Strive crossed around is around right around a billion dollars in assets under management about a year after I founded, after we launched that first fund when I was leading the firm. That's JP Morgan taking twice that time to get to the same milestone. The fact of the matter is when you fire underperforming employees, they strike back with their own narratives. You know what? That's exactly what's going to happen in the federal government. I'm bringing a 75 percent headcount reduction plan to the U.S. federal government. And the fact of the matter is a lot of underperformers, they're not going to be happy with that. That's been the story of how I've gotten ahead in my career. So, so you're, dis you're, dismissing, what, you're dismissing what they're saying. I mean, because what they do point out oh, in this is, yeah. is that uh, not a lot of thought was given to running your investment firm as an investment firm, that it was a PR mechanism for the presidential campaign. What do you say to that? The, I mean, it's another total lie from, you know, underperforming employees. They're going to try to you know, hold a situation hostage when a guy's profile is rising, but it is total trash. 
It's exactly what we're going to see more of. I expect we're going to see much of this coming out over the course of the presidential campaign. I'm ready for that. If you can't handle the heat, you stay out of the kitchen. The truth of the matter is I'm ready for that for the next eight years, running the federal government, firing underperforming employees. Many of them are not going to be happy about it, sitting in cush jobs in the federal government. I run my businesses the same way, call out the underperformers. That's why I've had such great success, frankly, in leading a business that delivered five FDA-approved medicines to actually build a multi-billion dollar biotech company from scratch, launching Strive to compete against BlackRock, getting to a billion dollars in assets under management in a year when J.P. Morgan took two years to get to the same place, really changing behaviors in corporate America's boardrooms, getting them to focus less on toxic politics and more on making profits for shareholders. Those are the kinds of accomplishments I've delivered. I'm 38 years old as an entrepreneur. I've done it in the private sector, taking on bureaucracy. The next bureaucracy I'm taking on is in the federal government. And a lot of underperformers aren't going to be happy about that, but that's the way I roll. You know, the thing, you are, are certainly resonating in the polls. There's no doubt about that. You're either number two or the third uh, most popular candidate among Republicans. Uh, but one thing that's very clear in a lot of these polls is your everyone's favorite number one choice for number two. In other words, if you don't make it to be the presidential nominee, more Republicans want you to be the vice presidential nominee than anyone else. Would you entertain that? Well, the fact, the fact is, Neil, many of these people didn't know who I was six months ago, and we're still sitting before the first debate. Donald Trump and I, I think, share something in common in that neither of us does well in a number two position. I'm built to actually lead the organizations that I've built. And I think that when I'm looking at the federal government, my greatest contribution, Neil, and one of my goals being to reunite this country, I'm going to be in the best position to get that done if I'm doing it from the top job. That's where my focus is. I've been very clear. I'm not interested in a different position in the government. Frankly, I'd drive change through the private sector sooner than becoming a number two or a number three in the federal government. Really? That's not about ego. That's not. That's that, about that, the fact that, that, of how that, I can that's drive. That's a heartbeat away from the presidency. Are you saying that you would turn it down if offered to you? I am. And the reason okay. why, Neil, is that if this were about my quest for personal power, sure, that makes sense. But that's not what this is about. This is about reviving our missing national identity, reaching the next generation of Americans who are badly disaffected from politics, a crisis of national pride. It is my job to make sure that my two sons and their generation are once again proud to be citizens of this nation. Neil, I think we're already doing that in this campaign, bringing young people along in droves. I'm going to be best positioned to do that as the next president. And for me, November 2024, it's not even the destination. That is the start line. The real destination is January 2033. My older son won't even be in high school then. What do I want to tell the people of this country we accomplished? Above all, it's that the next generation is once again proud to be American, unapologetically so, reviving the dream of the American Revolution. And I'm only going to be able to do that if I'm the next president, leading a revolution like Reagan did in 1980. That's what I'm aiming to lead in 2024. You know, what's interesting is uh, you do things very differently than other candidates. And clearly, uh, uh, you know, you go anywhere, you'll talk to anyone. You don't pick and choose where you go or the questions that are asked. It's very admirable. Uh, this latest thing that's drawn a great deal of attention, Vivek, is your, your so-called Ten Commandments. I, I don't know if you call them that outright, but you, you do say that uh, among them, God is real. Uh, there are two genders. You talk about reverse racism being racism, that an open border is no border, that parents, uh, you know, determining the education of their children is, is probably a good idea, a sound idea. Uh, but more and more people are, are quoting this. And I go on some of the social media. I'm, I'm not at all adept at social media, by the way. But I, I, I hear a lot of the, the, the trending and the attention it's getting. Um, it, uh, I likened it to a modern day Thomas Paine's common sense. Was your idea to yes. stop people in their tracks and say, this sums up who I am, who Republicans should be. But why did you do those commandments? One step further than that, not just who Republicans should be, but who Americans should be. We are a nation founded on the truth. And the reason we've been so explicit about it, Neil, is I think there is a gap between what people are willing to say in private and what people are willing to say in public. In fact, that gap is an indictment of our civic health as a country right now. So what I'm doing in this campaign is I'm speaking that truth. 
speaking that truth in the open on behalf of most Americans who share those same basic values in common, that idea that the nuclear family is the greatest form of governance known to mankind, that capitalism is the best system known to man to lift people up from poverty, that the U.S. Constitution is the strongest guarantor of freedom in human history. These things are true, Neil. We should not apologize for the truth. My view is we stand up for the truth. That's what won us the American Revolution. I think that is what will win us the revolution of 2024. And I think that is the true choice we face in this primary. Do you want incremental reform? If you do, I'm not your guy. Do you want reform or do you want revolution? I stand on the side of the American Revolution, reviving those 1776 ideals that got us 250 years into this American experiment. And if you ask me, we're not a nation in decline. I think we're really just a little young, actually, going through our own version of adolescence and identity crisis, figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. And my job as our next president is to lead us there, to lead us to our adulthood. And the way we're going to get there is, yes, by speaking the truth, doing it without apologizing for it, because that is who we are as Americans. And that's what this campaign is all about, including a Thomas Paine common sense style approach. Right. We actually distribute leaflets in Iowa and New Hampshire that look like Paine's pamphlets. And so you were correct to pick up on that. Real quickly, the rap lately in a lot of your recent comments is that you're an isolationist, uh, that some people think you would let China invade Taiwan, that you would let Vladimir Putin or make any concessions to him to win in Ukraine. Real quickly, is that true? I'm not an isolationist. I'm a George Washington, America first conservative. I think we actually need to be stronger at home. Nuclear defense, cyber defense, super EMP defenses. Nobody else is talking about this. I just think we need to reorient our defense spending to actually defend the homeland, which absolutely is vulnerable. And I am moving our foreign policy, including places like Taiwan, from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity. That will actually allow us to project greater strength because people can trust us. Right. And the only way, you mark my words, that I will be a wartime president is if Joe Biden leads us into one. I will deter war by actually being strong at home. We'll watch closely. Vivek, thank you for taking the time, Vivek Ramaswamy. See you at the big debate next week. All right. In the meantime, we're monitoring developments with.